thank you. We're so pleased to have you here. So the one, the, the first question I have for you, Russell, is really about the diaspora. And if you could um, maybe talk to us about what it is, um, what have you guys done to uh, further your knowledge and research of it? And why does it matter to, to you, to us, to anybody around the world? In the beginning, five years ago, my only desire was to pull together Scots in the city of London. And we thought that would be an interesting thing to do. And it's just kind of grown since then. Um, we held a conference about 18 months ago, maybe two years ago, where we asked the question, what is the diaspora? And at that conference, we had representatives from diaspora organizations in Wales, Northern Ireland, Ireland, New Zealand, Australia, um, Belgium. I think there was someone from the UN as well, as well as some government reps. And what we all discovered was that we'd all managed to identify that a diaspora was individuals who had left or had links with another country. So people who had left Scotland, for example, and went to live in America, or perhaps were second or third generation Scots living in the States or around the world. And we heard from a chap, uh, Kingsley Aitkins, who's the world's leading expert on diaspora, a much vaunted figure used by the US government and many governments to talk about making these interconnections work. And what Kingsley said was that we all have this feeling of belonging. We all have it as human beings deep down inside us. And that, that feeling of belonging is strongest with our family, that family unit and that belonging there. But we also have this belonging to place or image or memory. And for so many of us who spend a lot of time outside Scotland or are now based elsewhere, a little bit of that belonging is to do with Scotland. So that was the, the core of diaspora. What we've seen in the world today, though, is that diaspora is a huge economic engine that's starting to be recognised, and never more so than now. You no, know, when the Scottish government entered lockdown, a call was made to um, Scots around the world who we thought could help with the supply of PPE equipment or some research, and there was a great response. So we've kind of built on that. We've also built on something which is an incredibly powerful tool and we're taking part in it today. And that tool is collaboration. So the thing about diaspora organizations is they can't compete. We can't compete with the New Zealanders because they are dealing with New Zealand people. We're only dealing with Scottish people. And what we've done is we've just found that we've just reached out and tried to help. And that's established a collaboration. And then we've got involved in doing things together. So we collaborate in, in Scotland, we collaborate with the Scottish Government, Global Scots, Scottish Development International, um, Entrepreneurial Scotland, there's a similar word in all the job titles. Um, but we also, also collaborate with the technology and innovation centres in Scotland. Around the world then, we collaborate with organisations which are interested in international trade and export and organisations that are interested in Scotland. So just as you guys, you guys flying that flag from that incredible building next to, um, I think it's next to Pier 39, is that right? Um, yes. mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's trying to keep this, to give us this opportunity to take part in Scotland. And I have to tell you, it's a very selfish mission. Two weeks ago, I got the opportunity to interview Craig Brown. This is an 80 year old man who at the peak of his career was the manager of Scotland's football team when we went to the Soccer World Cup in France. He was the manager of the opening game of that competition when the Scotland team went out to play Brazil, the greatest of footballing nations. And I asked Craig Brown, what was his memory of that day and his emotional feelings? And he said, the only thing he could remember was trying to get Sean Connery to get out the door in the changing room so the football team could leave. <laughs> and that memory, that's us. That's who we are. We are Scottish, you know? You go, could James Bond please move? The football players have got to get out. And it's that, that wonderful thing that we all have in common as Scots. That's so, that's so great. So, so you, you conducted this, this survey, right? 
And um, could you tell us what you found as the key findings? Like, what yeah. do people think of Scottish people? So, two years ago, or 18 months ago, we commissioned a survey by a research organization in Scotland. Again, someone we partnered with. They very kindly gave their time to do this survey. Our plan was to reach out to about 150, 200 Scots around the world with a structured questionnaire and then analyze the results and then go into more detailed research. The questions were about how was Scotland viewed? What were the positives about Scotland? What were the negatives about Scotland? And uh, again, the response we received was incredible. We ended up with 11, almost 1,100 people responded from 76 countries. Wow. It was amazing. You know, like to get a response from a Scot in Palestine was just amazing. The response is from right across Africa. Now, when we analysed the result, and, and I should point out, over 300 of the responses came from the US. It was by far the, the largest area to respond. Um, and and the, the answers that came back was that around the world, particularly in business, Scots are viewed positively. There's very little antagonism to Scotland as there is antagonism towards some nations. There's a belief that Scots are honest, hardworking, trustworthy. If they say they'll do something, they'll do it. Quite innovative, but also quite insular, quite inward looking, almost shy. And these were the kind of responses we got back. And it was about, um, our thought then was, how can we start to address those? So by acting on behalf of the Scottish companies for we would make the introduction, that was a good way to get across the fact that perhaps they weren't pushing out as well. What we also did though, is we analyzed some of the reasons. What is it about the Scottish culture that makes the Scots in Scotland slightly more reserved? What is it about their upbringing, about their, you no, know, perhaps the religious practices and the other things that go on in the country that's making people react in this way? And we felt it, there was, there was no common theme, but it was interesting with Scots that if you brought a company to Scotland, the company would say the reaction they got was amazing. You know, they would be, everyone would come out, they would help them, they would introduce them. They couldn't get over the hospitality that came in Scotland. And what we did was we identified, that was, that was part of this issue, was Scottish companies weren't reaching out enough beyond Scotland. So when, when Americans or other companies came to Scotland, we were really keen to work with them because that was the way we were doing economic international development. Now, what's happened since we did that survey? And I have to tell you, right? So we were so proud of the survey that we got 3,000 copies of the survey printed. We're a little not-for-profit, right? The whole budget went on all these boxes of, um, of, of uh, the, the guide. So our idea was that we would present copies of this report and the report was launched along with the Scottish government. So we got a lot of publicity. So we were all ready to start handing out copies of this guide right across everyone we met. And I received 3,000 copies of our report to my house the day before lockdown. Wow. So for the entire period of lockdown, I've had 3,000 copies of this report in my house. Now we've sent out digital copies and I'm delighted to share digital copies with everyone on, the, on, this, um, on this call. But that, that's what we did. We did the analysis to understand. And what it told us was, there was such a market for Scotland, outside Scotland, and we just had to get people moving to take advantage. What we discovered was that in Scotland, people would sort of think that that was Scotland and that was the rest of the world. And there was a, a problem trying to intellectually imagine the scale of the rest of the world. You know, people would say to me, oh, we're gonna try and open up in the US. And my question would be, well, where in the US? Which states, which cities, where are you going to focus? So there was that naivety. It, it could be a bit about our education as well. Our education's been much more Scotland or UK centric rather than global. You know, if you think about the, the low uptake in languages in Scotland, for example. But if I could just tell you what's happened in the last year has been remarkable. 
So because we've been primarily at lockdown and definitely not able to travel, there's been much more move to using technologies such as we're using today with Zoom to bring people together. And what Scotland has found is that when we hold an event like this to bring people together, people from all over the world join in. And that's amazing. And that's that suddenly started to make these connections that like Ayrshire Chamber of Commerce told mm -hmm. me that for 30 years, everybody who's attended their event has come from Ayrshire. And suddenly they've got people from um, Washington attending and someone attended from Zimbabwe and you know, someone, they got a note from someone in Australia who said, could they get a recording? So it was suddenly, we've had this kind of opening up moment in Scotland where we've got this perception about the rest of the world. But of course, we're also in a time of fear. So we're all a bit feared about what's going to happen and is it safe? Is, is um, we worry about health, which is quite obvious, but we also now are probably going to find that Scottish companies are slightly less open to risk and that's where we want to hope help them we want to connect them with you guys so that they know there's such opportunity for them out there so it's 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 a very interesting situation in one hand you're actually saying that this pandemic is is kind of good for some scottish businesses because they're able to digitize their business more and and get the word out more can you talk, um, I know the Scottish community has been having a, a really hard time. There's a lot of unemployment right now with COVID. It's kind of all over the world. Can you talk to some of the tactics that Scottish businesses are taking to really ensure their business success as they move through and out the other end of, of this pandemic? What are they doing to, to really ensure success? It, it's easy with the you know, the technology companies and the services company. I did a I did a talk recently and I said that um, provided your company had the word E in it, you were okay. So if you were e-commerce or e-learning or e-health, you've done well. But I'd like to take you on a little journey. So let's go to the Western Isles. So we'll go to the town of Harris on the Western Isles. And there's a business there called Essence of Harris run by a chap, Jamie McGowan. Jamie's got a very successful scent business. So he's got scented products like candles. Fantastic business. His business was growing really well. He'd opened up retail outlets in Edinburgh, in Glasgow, in airports at Inverness, Glasgow and Aberdeen, really starting to go well. And then the pandemic struck. So retail was closed. People weren't traveling. So his business suddenly stopped. He had a website and he was doing a small amount of sales online, but it wasn't a major part of his business. So what happened was, um, as a member of Scottish Business Network, we helped Jamie with that mindset change. Because it's really difficult changing your plan. If your plan is to open up beautiful retail outlets, it's really difficult to say, I can't do that. I'm going to have to stop. So we decided to focus on a digital footprint instead. You know, he would sell scented products online. You know, he could have an e-commerce shop or something. And the, um, the, what's happened with the Scottish and British governments is they've pumped a lot of money out to help companies go digital. Mm -hmm. But what Jamie did that was remarkably different is that rather than talking about his products, he talked about the landscape. So he talked about this incredible, unique part of the world on the Isles of Harris and Uist and Lewis. And he took pictures of the bay and the sunshine and the incredible atmosphere. And he started to get more and more international online connectivity. People started to find out about him and they wanted to buy his product, but they really wanted to know about that sheep. And they really wanted to know about why he appeared to have that the, the beach from Barbados was on the Isle of Harris. And he explained the fact that he took the picture there from Long Beach when it was a really sunny day. And it just looks like that. No, you couldn't tell the wind chill was minus 10. So he started to use these components of what makes Scotland unique to get this message across. And then he ran with it like a true entrepreneur. So he was picked up by Vogue magazine, both in the US and in China 
the China, China Vogue magazine article apparently is fantastic. He then got picked up by television and he ended up doing a, um, a secret entrepreneur program for, a, a, for a, a, a terrestrial TV channel in the UK. And suddenly he was selling product hand over fist. He'd really gr came to, to grips with not only how to sell online, but how to make his product unique, how to make the experience unique. So I think, I think Jamie's a really good example of the fact that he used Scotland much more because he'd come to realize through the online interactions that people wanted to know about this small Northern European um, country or nation, which they'd only ever experienced through um, television programs before. Mm -hmm. And that's been, that's been a real lesson for, um, for Scotland about the fact that we have a history and a recognition which is seen around the world. Mm -hmm. And a story, you know, it's, it's yeah. great, great a cultural experience to share with the rest of the world. And now we have this digital experience, which is good, too. You, you talked about the British government supporting yep. um, these businesses with, you know, going online and becoming more digital so that they can save their business. We have an election coming up in May. Can you tell us... Um, or give us your viewpoint on what you think, um, how the Scottish elections are going to go and how will they affect the businesses in Scotland and businesses outside of Scotland? It's quite interesting. It's, um, it's an election. So I've got no need to tell you guys that sometimes elections <laughs> are difficult to call. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see what the result is. Mm -hmm. I think... The big change that we saw in Scotland was to see um, Scottish members of parliament across the UK and also after devolution, members of the Scottish parliament. We saw that major change from the, the Labour Party being the major party to now seeing that the SNP being the major party and the Conservative Party and the others there. So I, I don't think I think this is incredibly difficult to see what's going to happen because we're asking a really different electorate. So we're asking people who have seen their lives turned upside down incredibly over the last year. And it'd be really interesting to see how, how they react to that. So that from a result point of view, I've got no idea. I think from a business community, what we, as with all businesses, what we want to see is certainty because certainty gives us the opportunity to plan and to make investments and make decisions. So at the current moment, I think we've in the UK, we've just passed 16 million people who have received their first injection of, the, um, of one of the vaccines. That's so the wonderful. vaccine, the vaccine programme rollout seems to be going exceptionally well. I think we've discovered that we're really good at logistics and we have, and the National Health Service is obviously just coming to its own. So I think that the vaccination program is going well. There's hesitancy across the world. And a big concern for me is international travel because we've seen it. Um, we've seen countries getting concerns about new variants of right. um, COVID and that closing down. Like the, what we've seen in Australia is just quite incredible whereby you know, three cases of COVID are reported. So a city shut for 72 hours. We've also seen like the air corridor between Australia and New Zealand closed. And in the UK, we've seen um, closure of uh, travel or restrictions on international travel. So I, I, think, I think for me, that's mm -hmm. a really big concern because of what I do. I think the business community as a whole is facing really difficult to tell what's going to happen. You know, what we would assume will happen is that we will come out of um, COVID. We've had um, furlough in place. So we've still got about 2 million people who are on furlough across the UK. So these are individuals who've been paid by the state, but won't actually be working. Now, I would imagine a large percentage of them may not be fortunate enough to go back to their previous jobs. Mm -hmm. What we've also seen though, is there is the most incredible pent up desire to spend. So we would imagine we're gonna see a trigger effect as well. The one thing I would add is that in the UK, we were way overdue another recession. So we've probably 
during this period gone through an economic reset as we would imagine as we would imagine we would see during a recession so i think our world's going to look very different by the summer um, i think businesses are going to react to that change in different ways we've probably moved forward with technology we've probably done five years technology rollout in what previously and over a period of a year and i think that's going to be a major factor as well but it, it's kind of we're, we're obviously all making this up as we go along. We, we don't really know. The major one for Scotland is the COP26 conference in November. So a lot of attention on that. So it's, it's, it, it, it's kind of it's there as a hope almost. You know, the largest summit to ever take place in the UK to take place in Glasgow is a major moment. But of course, we don't know. You know, we hope right. everyone's going to travel. At the present moment, you cannot book a hotel in Glasgow for the first two weeks in November. So all the demand is there. So it's. I think your original question was about the election, which I, I avoided. Right. I just. I, you know, <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. You know, there's, yeah, um, it's it's hard times. I mean, I, I read. Uh, I think it was this morning that GDP in the UK is suffering. You know, the biggest slump that it's had in three hundred years. Yeah. Where Where do you think, or where do you hope we can be in in five years' time? Do you think we'll still have this stink of COVID on us, or do you think we're gonna be back to normal, or you think it'll be a completely new, revolutionized normal? You know. I, I I've always held a belief that. Yeah, I, I can remember sitting on my dad's knee in Selkirk on the borders, watching a black and white television with man landing on the moon in 1969. Mm -hmm. Now, I've kind of believed that since 1969 up until 2019, our world in the UK was fairly stable. You know, there was no major, no, we, we had things like foot and mouth. We had things like industrial, uh, industrial relations problems. We had the economic changes in the early 80s, but we didn't have war. We didn't have, no, we didn't have major change. We had a couple of recessions during that time as well. But I think this has been a major reset for the UK. Mm -hmm. It's, um, I can still remember March the 24th when the British Prime Minister appeared on television to announce the first lockdown. And that felt to me like a tremendous emotional moment. But now we've got used to it. You know, we've, you know, people are wearing masks all the time here and we're, we're trying to get on with it. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, who would want to be a politician in the last year when you're trying to, you know, you're trying to decide we want to open up because of the economic reasons, but we also want to protect the populace. So really difficult questions for everyone. Mm -hmm. Crazy times. So what are the, um, the, the largest uh, industries in Scotland, you know, when we talk about the growth there? Can you give a, a kind of lay of the land as to who's working in what industries? I've heard yep. that the space program is, you know, taking off and uh, excuse the pun, but it sounds like there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on in Scotland. We'd love to hear about where people are spending their time. I think we're quite fortunate that we, we appear to have quite a diverse economy in the fact that Scotland has, a, a, for the size of the population, we have quite a large financial sector, primarily based out of Glasgow, strangely. We have a very strong tourist industry, of course. The technology sector, as it is across the world, is incredibly strong. We have that huge oil and gas base and research base coming out of Aberdeen. We have an economy which appears to be well positioned to take advantage of the new green technologies that we're going to heavily invest in and looking at sustainability. We still have a quite a large agrarian society as well with a large numbers of farms. So it's, it's quite a mixed economy, quite heavily. No, there is still quite a large public sector. It's a very small country, but we don't have the, the infrastructure for travel that we have in the central belt, we don't have that position fairly across the rest of the country. What we have seen though, is we've seen, or, or something we haven't seen. So we, if, if this was five years ago, our press would be full of stories of people who can't get online. And yet we, we've seen, you know, we've done our, a broadband rollout, which has improved for an awful lot of us, our internet capability. So we've got that connectivity. I think the other part that we've got is we, we still have quite a strong university base. 
and a very strong investment and in a very strong investment in innovation. So we have nine innovation centers covering things from 5G to data to um, uh, food to aquamarine and this whole area around about green technology. So, so I, I think when you look at the Scottish economy, it's quite mixed. Mm -hmm. That's great. So um, I'd, I'd love to kind of turn the tables here a little bit. There's a whole bunch of us on the phone here who all have Scottish roots, me included. And, you know, is there an opportunity for um, the Scottish ecosystem to get more involved in organizations like the St. Andrews Society? Like, what do you think of of us sitting across the pond? Like, what's your perceptions there and how can we get more involved together? So, so, so people look at me and think, Russell must be really clever to have come up with this Scottish Business Network plan and to have done the things we've done. But my cleverness is simply the fact I listen to other people and then just help them to achieve what they want. So if we look at what we've done with Scottish Business Network, we have a, a technology platform that allows us to connect our members, but really our driver has been our ambassadorial program. Mm -hmm. So we started, um, in, I was in Atlanta in January 2020 when we launched our first ambassador, Sandy Donaldson. And what we've done since then is we've started to put ambassadors in different cities around the world. Next month, this is amazing. So next month, I'm going to announce new ambassadors in Hyderabad in India, um, three new cities in the US, including Minnesota, Minnesota, and also La Paz in Bolivia. So we've got Scots around the world who want to take on this ambassadorial role. Now the ambassadorial role is like any ambassador, it's not a fixed position, it's whatever's the best thing to do there that will help. So what we're going to do in the US is we're going to put an ambassador into every state and into every major city. So this will be um, Scots or people of Scottish extraction who want to take those roles. To support them all, we've created a US entity, so a US company based out of New York, led by Ian Houston, who spoke at your, um, your burn supper. Yep. Now, they're gonna do the coordination of this. And what we're gonna to try to do is to partner with organizations like the St. Andrew Society of San Francisco and say, if you're doing something, tell us and we'll promote it and we'll tell you what we're doing. And then we'll try to encourage much more connectivity across the different groups across the US. So for example, um, we're hoping to plan to do some major initiatives and we'd love to partner with you on April the 6th. Mm -hmm. So April the 6th is starting day. That sounds like a great excuse to have a party. So we can't have a physical party. So we'll try to do something online. We had a dummy run for this on on Burns. Uh, for, we did a business and Burns event, which yeah. we, we, we brought speakers together, some of whom who spoke about Burns and their passion for the world, and some of whom who spoke about their passion for this modern Scotland that I find myself in today. So what we try to do is we acknowledge our link with the past, our heritage and our cultural values, but we also talk about the things that we're doing that are, are, mm -hmm. are, 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 are the more modern, more cutting edge. So you mentioned space, but we also talk about the social purpose of what we're doing as well. So what we hope to do on April the 6th is an event to to, to sort of bring together and highlight all those initiatives and to work with people like the St. Andrew Society of San Francisco. You no, know, just to hear a little bit about what's happening with you, what's happening in San Francisco, what's happening in California, and why is that of interest to Scotland and why Scotland should be engaging more with these types of opportunities. I, I'm very fortunate. I, I, for five years, I spent every April bringing across Scottish technologists to, um, to, to San Francisco and Silicon Valley to go and take part mm -hmm. in various meetings. So I've always believed that it's making these connections that makes the difference. And the big change from Scotland is about mindset. Because if you remember that Scotland you left behind, the people that you were working with weren't saying, oh, we're going to have to go and do business in, in Oakland. That's where we think our opportunity is. People weren't thinking like that. But perhaps with your help, people will think more like that and about the fact that, you know, San Francisco is these different parts of the city. 
that the fact that you will know people that you could make an introduction to that might just help a Scottish company move forward. And we all want to do that. That's our passion. Mm -hmm. That's that's great. And so you, you talked about um, Tartan Day and there's a number of different Scottish events that happen through the year. Like what is is your vision of how those types of um, celebrations may unfold in the future? Well, I, I think it's about helping each other. So if the St. Andrew's Society of San Francisco was looking for a speaker for future talks like these, we would be delighted to attempt to identify some speakers for you. Mm -hmm. I have a fantastic chap who we spoke at our event last night. His name's Barry Fudge. He's a sports psychologist. And for six years, he was he trained Mo Farah, Sir Mo Farah, the, the, the distance, the, the greatest distance runner now in mm -hmm. British history. A fantastic individual to hear from. So that's how we could perhaps help you. And it may be the fact that you're, you've got some events planned or you're, you're, you're looking to do something in a particular sector. So it's whatever we can do to help. That's the way that we build partnership. And then when we're doing something, we'll tell you and you might say, well, we'd like to get involved or we could put up a speaker or we could, um, we could run a panel discussion. We found that online panel discussions are fantastic. No, because people, you know, we get to speak at this accelerated rate that as Scots we speak at, and we get to mix together this whole thing about business along with, along with um, you know, discussions about what's the best thing to buy in a chip shop. No, because it's the cultural thing as right. well as the business piece. And what we think that's the most important when we do these online events is that they mustn't be boring. Because if there's one thing Scottish people don't like, it's boring. So that's what we try to do. So we try to make these exciting and interesting. So if, if, you, if you share with us your plans for the year, we'll try to see where we could help. That's great. Well, I will definitely be sharing our plans with you. So we're looking forward to that. Um, Russell, this has been really wonderful. I would like to open it up um, to questions. We have a question here. Jen, will this change come in DREF 2.0 or do you see the Scottish Business Network supporting a true State Department type diplomatic function like the British Council and the British Chambers of Commerce function? We also have the British American Business Council, of course, out here as well. So, as I said, my skill is to listen. So I'll let our members take us on whatever journey they think is the most important. I had no idea a year ago that I would be opening an office in New York. That wasn't, no, that, that, that wasn't part of my plan, but it's just kind of the, the members that we have in the US wanted to do that and felt it was a good thing to do. Um, I think to look at um, a second Scottish independence vote, I think it'll be an interesting journey to mm -hmm. see a, if it happens and if it does happen, what will the outcome be? My, my personal opinion is that when I look at countries that have voted for separation, so we've obviously seen a number of those across Eastern Europe, there's been a, a, a rather significant majority who've wanted to do that. Um, what we've also seen in the UK, though, is that um, sometimes you have to be very careful what you ask for. Because, of course, uh, the ex-British Prime Minister David Cameron thought a good idea to bring together the Conservative Party would be to have a vote on whether or not the UK should be part of Europe. So that took us on a very interesting journey, which um, I don't think um, many of us really thought that was going to be a very good idea. Mm -hmm. So I think we just have to let the democratic process play out. We're completely agnostic. We no, no. We, we we're Scottish. We're not we're not particularly aligned with any. Well, we're not aligned at all with any political party. We're completely independent. Our Scotland is the one that it's the same Scotland as you. It's this one of belonging. This one of memory. Mm -hmm. You know. So, um, we we do. Obviously, we do meet with Scottish ministers as members of the Scottish National Party. But I've also met with leaders of the Conservative Party and the other parties. We also do quite a lot through Westminster as well because. One of the things that we remind Scottish companies of is they're British as well. So you might as well take advantage of being Scottish and British because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a twin win. So why not do that? Mm -hmm. 
So um, you, you talk about Scotland and I just, you know, I've got such itchy feet to be able to get on a plane and go there. Um, and I think I might be able to do that if I went through London, I'm not sure. But anyway, can you can you talk to the people on the phone about, you know, in the summertime, there's a lot of Americans who really want to go to Scotland. Yeah. We're missing it right now. Like if you had the chance to go, where would you go? What would you see? And what would be the one kind of, really personal experience that's maybe off the beaten track that you think people should do or see, whether it's even just having a poke of chips and a can of iron brew or going to visit somewhere special. What a brilliant question. Um, I come from the Scottish borders, so um, I'm completely biased. I think to get the chance to spend time in that part of the world, is just very special. It's incredibly beautiful. So it's not the mountains, it's all rolling countryside. Um, I think we have some incredible assets in Scotland that aren't so well known. I took an American visitor last year to Falkirk. And you kind of think, well, Falkirk in central Scotland, that's where the train goes through. And I took him at dusk to go and see the Kelpie stru structure. Oh, lovely. And he felt it was one of the greatest things he'd ever seen. He, he just couldn't believe that there was something of that scale. So I think we have these secret assets in Scotland. There's so a, can you um, um, describe the Kelpies for people on the phone who may not know? I've I've been there and they're absolutely magnificent. <laughs> it's really difficult. It's, it's, it's two horses' heads of, um, oh, they're, they're really, what's a really large horse called? Um, Clydesdale. So they're Clydesdale horse heads, and it's as though the Clydesdales are actually um, in a in a river or a canal, and it's their heads reaching out. But it's which the is most like a kelpie, stuff. right? A, a water horse. Yeah. Yeah. Water horse, yeah. And and they're huge. They're like I don't know, ten stories high. Yeah, yeah. Like you you you're left in wonder at Falkirk Council and go, how did you sign that? <laughs> right. Oh, like fantastic, you did it. But, yep. you know, you, you just can't quite imagine a council meeting where someone said, right, we're going to put in two horses' heads, 10 stories high. Is everyone in agreement? But it worked, and, it, and it's wonderful. I, I think if I was coming to Scotland and I didn't have long on the trip, mm -hmm. I would plan to make sure I saw the places that are the, the, the memories, so that the Edinburgh Castle and, and to see Glasgow as well. But I think to see the Highlands. I think it's quite it's quite difficult to describe that light. And um, I think to go and, and spend time there. And I'm always reminded when, when I speak about the Highlands, I'm always reminded from the piece in Train Spotting, where in the film Train Spotting and the guys go to the Highlands and they go, now what? Right. All right. And, and they get it, off it, the train in now. the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, it's so astonishing. You know, it's it's to go into a local bar or a local restaurant. I'll tell you one thing that um, during the summer when we were traveling in, in Scotland, a lot of people took their vacations in Scotland and the recurring theme was that people were quite shocked by how good the food was. So, you know, they'd maybe traveled in Scotland 10 or 20 years ago and the food had been um, acceptable. Whereas now they were saying this was just incredible, the, the, the rich variety and the service. Mm -hmm. That is great. Okay, well, I um, I do not have any other questions. I would love, does anybody else on the phone have any questions? I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about um, something that I found. I was I was I was in Spain when um, the Scottish football team finally qualified for a competition after waiting twenty years, and I found that for Scottish football or soccer fans. There was a common experience about how we participate in televised sport. So if you imagine American football or any normal sports, you watch the sport. If you're Scottish and we're winning, you watch the clock and the clock goes 10, we're winning 10 minutes to go, five minutes to go, 40 seconds to go. Oh no, the other team have scored. And, and it's it's the most, it, it was a similar experience to every Scot I spoke to across the world was we'd all just watch this clock. <laughs> Must be something about the sense of belonging. That's great. I have a question here from Matthew. He's not yeah, able sure. to um, unmute. So he's just typing that in right now. And then there's another everyone. question. Um, sorry. Sorry, I should tell everyone that I, I should have said that at the start. So I'm in Linlithgow. 
uh, just outside ah, Edinburgh. Yeah. So to my left is Lothlithgow Lock and the three-storey um, Lothlithgow Palace, which was the birthplace of Mary Queen of Scots. And the beautiful, yeah, it's it's absolutely so gorgeous there. Oh, I've spent wonderful. a lot of time there. Um, so Greg is asking, um, what is your favorite brand of Scotch, Scottish whiskey? We have so, a lot of great distilleries over there. What's your passion? So I'm a very unusual Scot in the fact that I don't drink alcohol. So uh, I, I don't have a favorite Scotch. However, Scottish, you would be pleased to hear that Scottish Business Network appeared in a, a, a BBC Scotland programme last week where we were raising our plans for how our team in the US are going to try and influence the State Department on this horrible tax that's on single malt. Because um, if there's one thing we all want to do, it's to write to our senators and representatives and tell them that just because something's gone wrong with an aircraft deal, you can't go around penalizing Scottish whiskey. That's incredible. Okay, so we're still waiting for a question. Here it comes in from Matthew. He says, um, let me just make this bigger here. He said, as you mentioned, the US is a mature market that many in Scotland do not fully understand the complexities of. How do you prepare Scottish companies to be ready to engage in this market? Brilliant question. So um, to, to, it's not just Scottish companies that don't understand America. It's Britain as a whole. I sold a company out of London and I sold it to investors from um, Detroit. So once the deal had gone through, my team were desperate to go to America because in their head, America was sunshine and beaches. So I sent them to Detroit in January. <laughs> it was 20 foot of snow and they were phoning up going, can you get, we're in some place called Michigan. Can you please get us out of here? <laughs> so that misunderstanding of America is ripe across the UK. So mm -hmm. we, we came up with a, 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 a method to help Scottish companies in America. So what we would do is we'd organize, so we had a company, it was to say in the education sector. So we would organize a Zoom call like this and we would try to get eight members of our diaspora from across the US, all working in different sectors to come onto the call. And we would do a one hour call and we'd give the Scottish company the opportunity to present their US strategy to this audience. And what we would say, so the Scottish company would go, no, no, we want to talk about our product. I said, no, you tell them what your strategy is and allow them to comment on that. And what was really interesting was that the feedback from the group was all about, um, you can't have a strategy that says, you, you, you must have a really focused strategy. You must make it partnership based. You must have worked out where about in the US you want to specifically target. And we found that those sessions work really well as a way to share the type of experience you guys have got naturally with Scottish companies that want to come over. Mm -hmm. That's great. And so um, another question, you know, Scottish companies that, that want to come over and vice versa, do you have uh, or do you know of expat groups in Scotland for kind of American Scottish people to join? We're a Scottish American group here. Is there American Scottish groups in Scotland? So this is gatherings of U.S. citizens in Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I, I do some work with the American consulate in Edinburgh. So I know that they do a, like a 4th of July celebration. Weirdly, never on the 4th of July. It's usually the 3rd or the 5th. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm not aware of any, any gatherings. It may be that there isn't the, um, the numbers, but I'll, I'll check on that and see if I can, I can find anyone. Yeah, thank you. Um, our next question comes from uh, David Campbell. He is the chair of the St. Andrews Society of San Francisco. Um, he says, during a time of Brexit and future consideration of Scottish independence, can you speak to the cross-channel relationships and perspectives regarding Ireland, Northern Ireland, and the Scandinavian countries? Yeah. Um, it's a challenging one. We're all really confused. Mm. Um, so the, the relationship with Europe, because we're in the middle of, um, I have to face it, if Brexit was going to happen in the middle of a pandemic was a good time because we were absolutely sick to death with the press talking about what might happen, right? 
So that saved us having to go through all that. Um, we're waiting for a stabilization of how the UK exports and imports from Europe. We are seeing reports from individual companies that it's not working the way that they were told it was going to work. So it's much more um, bureaucratic and much more expensive to actually export to Europe. And mm -hmm. um, the question about Northern Ireland is particularly concerning. So in order to um, protect the Good Friday deal, um, they put in place a special allowance around about Northern Ireland. And there's real concerns about how Northern Ireland, like I've got, um, we, we've got friends in Belfast and they're going, you know, our supermarkets seem to be a little bit light on on certain commodities. Custard so creams, I heard. There. Yeah, so there's a concern there, particularly in Northern Ireland. I think what will happen with Brexit is that we'll discover all the minutiae of it over the coming months as we all start to experience it much more. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would be daily on the on the news about the problems people are experiencing if it wasn't for the fact that the, the, the first story to the press is the pandemic or the fact that one prince is one princess is pregnant. You know, that, that's the kind of, obviously that's the front story. But um, then it's the, um, the, then it's the one about, <laughs> about COVID. Um, yeah. But I think, I think Europe is a real concern. I think getting the treat, so we're running an event um, tomorrow for Scottish Business Network members with um, uh, the, the lead negotiator from the UK on the US-UK trade deal. So we've still got hopes that that might proceed. Um, that was actually going to be one of my last closing questions that most of Scotland's trade is is with the US. And, you know, now we actually have a new president who um, may not have been as supportive for trade to the UK as um, Mr. Trump was. And so do you think that there's going to be a change in in trade to the US and I mean, I guess there's just so many moving parts with Scotland, but how do you feel about Scotland's future of trade with the US? It's, I, I'm, a, I'm an optimist. So I think that through the work I've done in the last five years, I think there is incredible opportunity for Scottish and British businesses in the US. They're not, they're not scratching the surface of the size of the opportunity. Um, I think whichever political party or president is in place in the US will influence that a little bit more or a little bit less. But actually the opportunity is so big, if we could encourage more businesses to get involved, they might spot the fact that, you know, if, if you could be a major success in Miami, you could probably completely transform your company. You know, you don't have to do the whole of the US. So I think it's to encourage that. My biggest concern for Scotland has always been our um, lack of direct flights. So the direct flights has been by far the biggest issue because if anyone comes from anywhere and arrives at Heathrow, they're probably gonna do meetings in London first. So whoever in Scotland took the decision in 1952 to say, I know, let's have an airport in Edinburgh and an airport in Glasgow, rather than just one muckle airport in Stirling, that's, that's the problem that we deal with on a daily basis. It's been interesting that since flights stopped because of the pandemic, um, I think Scotland became more interesting because we were, we were equally difficult to get to as everyone else was. But I think we have to fight really hard to get direct flights. You know, Norwegian Air a couple of years ago was pretty close to doing an Edinburgh, um, Ed Edinburgh, um, mm -hmm. Auckland. Auckland flight. Yep, yeah, they did. Yeah. Which would have been fantastic. I'd have been on that. But it, it, it's, I think at the end of the day, what I try to do and what Scottish Business Network tries to do is by introducing Scottish businesses to you guys and you guys go, yeah, you could do that. That gives them the confidence. It's not enough to have a, you know, a, a trade advisor in Scotland going, these are the rules for exporting to New York. It's not enough of that. It's more in the head and it's more understanding what's possible and the fact that educating Scottish companies to realise that we all want them to be a success. We really, really, really want them to be a success and we want to help. And that's what I've got to try and get them to do more and more. And we believe our ambassador programme will help with that. 
That's great. You have exciting times ahead of you, Russell. Um, Every day is exciting. I, I believe it is. Russell, thank you so much for spending time with us today. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure as always to talk to you. It's uh, always entertaining, um, but very educational and enlightening too. And I love just hearing everything that's going on in Scotland. It's, uh, it's a great country and I'm sure everybody on the phone would agree with me there. If I could just close by saying, if, if anyone's got an idea or a suggestion that they think we should try to do, please shout. You know, because no, no idea is a bad idea. We want to try these things. I desperately want to get back on a plane and back over to California again. And, and I want to be doing this in person where we can... Mm. You know, someone said that. We want to get back to sharing air again. That's what we want to do. We want to get back to being together. I completely agree with you on that one. Well, thank you again. Have a great evening in Scotland. Thank you to all of our participants and all of your questions. Um, I will keep you posted on our speaker series. And uh, Russell, you and I will be in touch to line up some of those wonderful speakers. I can't wait. It's going to be a great year for us. Delighted to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.